Professor Dawkins, why are you so wound up about the position of faith in our society? I'm wound up about the truth. I care passionately about the truth as a, as a scientist, and I do regard religious claims about the universe as alternative scientific claims. So the claim that the universe contains a god, contains a creative intelligence, is a scientific claim, because the universe would be a very different kind of universe with such a being than without it. So that's part of it. I'm, I'm, I care about the truth. But of course, you phrase the question as wound up in society. And I think you really only have to look around the world to see why one might be wound up about religion in society. But when you hear, for example, today on the day of the Jewish New Year, you hear the chief rabbi on the radio this morning talking about how there is a, a purpose to our existence. What do you think? Well, in one sense, there is a purpose to our existence, which is the propagation of DNA. But that's not a very uplifting purpose. It's not the kind of purpose he means. I think there's a purpose to each individual's existence, which is a purpose that we make for ourselves. And you make your own purposes, I make my own purposes. That's different from the kind of purpose to existence, which somebody like the chief rabbi means. I was struck by one sentence in your book, in the middle of it. God almost certainly does not exist. Yes. You're leaving open the possibility that he does. Of course, any scientist would leave open that possibility. You can't absolutely disprove the existence of anything. So just as we can't disprove the existence of Thor and Zeus and the flying spaghetti monster, we, we can't be dogmatic and say it is certain that God doesn't exist. We can say it is as unlikely as Thor with his hammer. I could call myself an a-thorist to, to give the idea of that. But your conclusion is, or your ambition, I suppose, is that people reading this book abandon any sense of belief in a deity. That's an absurdly ambitious ambition. It is my ambition. Um, I don't see any harm in aiming high. I'm aware that there are a large number of dyed-in-the-wool faith heads who will never be changed, but I think there's a big middle ground of people who actually haven't thought about it very much, who think of themselves as religious, but haven't given it very much thought, and I really hope they might be changed. But you're a scientist, and science is an extrapolation of what we perceive through our senses, isn't it? And some people have a sense of God. Uh, we know that the brain is a very, very complicated thing. We know that it's capable of simulation. All the, it does it all, all the time. It, it, it simulates the world. Simulating a god, simulating a, a vision, simulating a still small voice would be child's play to a computer of that sophistication. Have you never stood on the top of a mountain or something and been stunned by what you've seen and had some spiritual sense? Most certainly. It's a, it's a very different sense from a religious spiritual sense, however. I mean, the first chapter of my book is about Einsteinian religion, and Einstein had that feeling, as I do, when contemplating the universe, contemplating the laws of physics. That's nothing to do with God, as ordinary people understand God, which is a personal being who reads your thoughts, forgives your sins, um, uh, knows, what, knows everything that, that you do, raises you from the dead, and so on. So what is the Bible? It's a collection of documents written by people in the first millennium BC, um, like any other tribal mythology attempting to make sense of the world. All, all tribes have them, they're all different. This really? happens to be the Jewish one. And the New Testament? The New Testament is, is a, a modification which, um, which has come to us because of the invention of Christianity by St. Paul um, in the first century. And uh, accounts of the miracles and nonsense, are they? Surely, yes. I mean, um, the virgin are, birth. Yes. Um, the resurrection. They're all yes. All, the I mean, ascension. If you look at yes, they're if you look nonsense. at any any of those um, any religions that were about at the same time, all those stories are duplicated many times throughout the ancient world. These are very very common myths, and um, they happen to have been bound together in the New Testament. Would you at least accept that the position or the possession of a religious faith? gives people a sense of comfort, a sense of purpose, and a moral code. Yes. Um, a sense of comfort it gives you, that of course has no bearing whatsoever on the truth value of religious claims. It's one thing Does to that say, matter? Yes, I think it does. Why? I mean, because, maybe because I just happen to be the kind of person who cares about what's true. Um, if you're the kind of person who says, I don't care what's true, all I want to hear is what's comforting. I just want to be told the good news. I don't want to be told anything about what's true. Then you're welcome to it. But I don't believe you're that kind of person. And I, I don't think you would respect anybody who was. Where is the evidence that a rational society is any more moral 
or indeed a better place to live than a religiously based culture? I don't know if there is any evidence. I expect there is. But even if there wasn't, I don't think you, could wish to, you would wish to live in a society which lived a lie. I think you'd rather live in a society which, was, which had a truthful view of the world, of the real world, even if it led to um, less happiness, which I don't for a moment believe it does. But if the only justification for religion is it makes people happy, then um, you might as well just all, all take drugs and, and, and make yourself happy that way. What's wrong with being happy? Nothing wrong with being happy, but some of us feel that being truthful, some of us feel that facing the, the world of reality, fair and square and, and honestly, is better than living a lie. Do you think that political leaders are worse or more dangerous if they have a religious conviction? Not all of them are worse, but there certainly are, are some, I think, who are. Um, if you believe that you have a divine mission, if you believe that God told you to invade Iraq, um, if in even more extreme cases, if you believe, I don't think any leading politician believes this, but certainly many of their constituents do in America, believe that Armageddon is devoutly to be desired because that's the end of the world which will presage the second coming of Christ. Many of Bush's constituents literally do believe that. They long for nuclear war. He doesn't, but he's supported by a lot of people who do. Um, it could very well be the case that being religious, having that kind of faith, that kind of conviction, that kind of unshakable conviction, could be very dangerous in a, in a politician. It means you don't listen. It means you don't, um, you don't listen to advice. You simply know what's right because God told you or the Holy Book told you. Do you also think that all religiously inclined scientists are bad scientists? No. Um, by the way, most religiously inclined scientists, if you ask them deeply, turn out not to be religiously inclined in any more than the Einsteinian sense. The Einsteinian sense being what I mentioned earlier. Of well, there are several scientists, prominent scientists, there are some, who yeah. do have religious convictions, yes. who would dispute that vehemently. Well, there are some. But you have to be very careful. When, when, a, when a scientist says he's religious, it usually turns out that he believes that the universe is a deeply mysterious place, the kind of thing Einstein would have said. Now, there are some genuinely religious scientists who really are Christians, say. And um, they're not very numerous, but I'm, I must say I'm baffled by them. Do you think they're bad scientists? No, they're... no, I don't. No, I don't. Um, but I think they do it by a kind of compartmentalization of the mind. You don't understand how they can reconcile these two ways of viewing the world? No, I don't. Not really, no. Um, I suppose maybe we all compartmentalise a bit, and I suppose I can just begin dimly to understand it from that point of view, but it's pretty difficult for me to. What do you hope you'll achieve with this book? Because it's, it, um, it is, it's a very entertaining read, uh, and it's very, very convincing. It's slightly strident in tone in places, because you obviously care very deeply about this. Yeah. But what do you hope to achieve with it? I hope to um, persuade not everybody, but a substantial number of sort of middle-of-the-road people that there's nothing wrong with disbelief in God. There's nothing um, outlandish about it. It's probably what, they are, what they, they're like anyway, if only they admitted it to themselves. So it's a kind of um, self-help to atheism, I suppose. Well, as, as they would doubtless say on some sort of American chat show, so what gets you through the night then? <laughs> um, the same things as get, get most people through the night. I mean, um, Love of human fellowship, um, of love of nature, love of art, love of the world, love of life, love of science, um, uh, love of children, love of music, all the things that everybody else has. And you're comfortable with that? I am comfortable with that, but even if I wasn't, it wouldn't change what I believe, because I'm, I don't believe we're put here to be comfortable. Richard Dawkins, thank you. Thank you very much.